In theory, in theory, that's what it's for, but like nobody actually uses it for that. Good evening and welcome to Columbia Journalism School. I'm Jelani Cobb. I'm the dean of the journalism school. It's great to be able to welcome uh, everyone back to Pulitzer Hall after a two-year pandemic hiatus. Uh, and you know, it's really important that we kind of acknowledge uh, these hallmarks. Uh, I remember uh, when we first started having events, uh, just how excited people would get when I walked into a room. I was like, this is really amazing. Uh, and then it was like, oh no, they're just excited that they're not in their living rooms. Uh, so we're happy that you are all here. We're here to celebrate outstanding environmental reporting from the past year with the 2022 John B. Oaks Awards. This award is given annually to reporting that makes an exceptional contribution to the public's understanding of environmental issues. There are fewer, <coughs> excuse me, there are few more critical issues today than our environment and our planet's climate. This award was founded in 1993 and honors the memory of John Bertram Oakes, the influential editorial writer and editor from the New York Times, known for his intellect and passion. Mr. Oakes was a pioneer of the environmental journalism movement and is credited with creating the contemporary op-ed page at the Times. I'd like to welcome one of his children and one of his grandchildren who are here with us tonight, Andra and Anna Oakes. And I would like to thank the Oaks Award jury for their diligent work selecting tonight's winners and finalists from a record number of entries. And thank you to our professional prizes department and for all they do to uphold journalism standards for the profession. Before we get started, a few words about the importance of covering the environment now. I had an interesting experience earlier today. I took the car to the dealership, which is not a exciting thing to do. Um, but it is very exciting if it happens to be during UN General Assembly, <laughs> meaning that you could take the car down, but once everyone converged on Manhattan, there was no way you were going to get that car back out. Uh, so I decided to hike across town and get the train back uptown. And over the course of my walk, I saw people kind of going out of their way and stomping and doing kind of weird things. <laughs> I was like, what is this? And then I realized it was the lantern flies. <laughs> and I had kind of seen this and been like, the connection between what's being reported in the news and how people's lives are impacted is very apparent. And this is a kind of random thing that you might mention just on your way home. Oh, I saw all these people, all these high school kids uh, who were just stomping on lanternflies and trying to save the uh, environment or trying to save agriculture by you know, this diligent ad hoc army uh, of stompers. Uh, but it also made me think more about the ways in which our lives are impacted in much more profound ways that this was just a small, a microcosm of the much bigger impact, the much bigger relationship of the environment to our lives. Something I don't need to emphasize given what the past two years have been like in all of our lives. And so it has never been more crucial to see important, uh, groundbreaking, uh, deeply reported work that highlights these connections and highlights the importance of recognizing the impact that we have on the environment and the reciprocal impact that the environment has on us. And so I will stop and we can get to uh, the reason that you are all here. Let's talk about tonight's winners. 
The jury selected one winning entry and two finalists for the Oaks Award this year. We'll start by honoring the finalists before we move on to the prize winner. Then Amelia Ascari, a judge for these awards, will moderate a short panel with our honorees before they take your questions. The first finalist for the 2022 Oaks Award for Distinguished Environmental Reporting goes to Sharon Lerner and The Intercept for tracking the invisible killer, Trump EPA, excuse me, Trump's EPA invited companies to revise pollution records of a potent carcinogen. Lerner's investigation into ethylene oxide, a colorless, odorless, and all but invisible gas that can kill, took readers from Lake County, Illinois, to Port, Port Neches, Texas, where she documented deliberate wrongdoing by multiple perpetrators, chemical companies that make the agent used in sterilizing plants, and also the agency charged with oversight, the EPA. Her reporting showed that after the EPA announced it would be lowering the inhalation threshold for the gas in 2016, seven companies retroactively changed their reports to show they had emitted less of the carcinogen. In the process, according to Lerner's public, excuse me, according to Lerner's tally, almost 270,000 pounds of the carcinogen were erased from the public record. Shockingly, some company representatives told Lerner that they made, these suggest they made these changes at the suggestion of EPA officials. In their citation, the judges wrote, throughout her investigation, Lerner never lost sight of the people at the center of it all, the victims whose lives have been upended and sometimes ended by innocently living in the vicinity of a chemical many knew nothing about. Here to accept the finalist award for tracking the invisible killer from The Intercept, please welcome Sharon Lerner. Our second finalist award tonight goes to FEMA's Disasters, a series from the Washington Post and reporters Hannah Dreyer and Andrew Batran. At a time when an unprecedented four out of 10 Americans lived through major national, natural disasters last year, and 25 million people applied for federal help to get back on their feet, what does recovery look like over the long term? This year-long investigative series asked, as disasters become more frequent and severe, does the government really have the backs of Americans most affected by climate change? Reporters Hannah Dreyer and Andrew Batran found widening holes in the safety net, with aid especially out of reach of poor families and people of color. Drawing on months of embedded reporting and an analysis of 9.5 million records, they revealed the government was leaving poor families stranded in trailer parks with no plan to transition out, stalling efforts to protect the effort, excuse me, stalling efforts to protect against the effects of climate change, systematically excluding black people in the deep south from help. The judges commend the journalists in the Washington Post for a series that compelled agency reforms, legislation, and an executive order to bring about meaningful change. Here to accept the finalist award for the Washington Post and FEMA's disasters, please welcome Hannah Dreyer and Andrew Batran. Congratulations. <laughs>
Now I'd like to introduce the winners of the 2022 John B. Oaks Award for Distinguished Environmental Journalism. ProPublica, with partners Time, Univision, Noticias, and Truly California K KQED, is being honored for the investigative series, Postcard from Thermal, Surviving the Climate Gap in Eastern Coachella. This story took the crucial subject of climate change, of climate justice, and made it specific, personal, and compelling. In the midst of the climate crisis, with record high temperatures and wildfires, the team profiled a family who had been living, who had been struggling to find livable housing in the desert. The jury called this project, quote, a triumph of modern storytelling that presented an urgent case study on what is known as the climate gap the disproportionate toll that climate change is taking on the lives of people of color and the poor. Nowhere is that gap more dramatic than in the perfectly named town of Thermal, California, which is simultaneously a playground for the rich with a nearly uninhabitable home for farm workers who must contend with dust storms, arsenic-laced water, and some of the hottest temperatures on the continent. The project succeeded in telling the big picture of this environmental injustice through the small picture of one immigrant family's plight and also brought about specific reform with that family and others moved into far better housing. In this excerpt of a video from the series titled Unlivable Oasis, we'll meet that family and witness the climate-related challenges they faced. Sí, está difícil vivir aquí. Pues, pues, ¿sabes que el clima está loco? El tiempo se vuelve loco. No tenemos muchas opciones para movernos de ahorita. Housing in where we live and the changing climate will make it worse. It's like you're in a metal box. En las áreas como Pan Spring, Pan DC, el sistema eléctrico es mejor, el agua es segura, tiene mejor recursos allá. Our residents are working for agricultural companies that are multi-million dollar companies, five-star hotels, country clubs, and yet they're taking home the absolute bare minimum wages. It's 100% a structural problem. We have been more ignored by the fact that the majority of us don't have documents. Our country is the Please welcome from ProPublica reporters Elizabeth Weil, Mauricio Rodriguez Pons, and Molly Simon. Congratulations to ProPublica and to this year's two finalists from The Intercept and The Washington Post. Now to our panel. I'd like to invite Emilia Ascari, 
tonight's moderator to the stage. <laughs> Amelia is a judge for these awards and a graduate of the journalism school. She was a longtime reporter with the Detroit Free Press and now teaches environmental reporting at the University of Michigan. Joining the discussion will be Sharon Lerner, Hannah Dreyer, and from ProPublica, Pro Liz Weil and Mauricio Pons. Congratulations again to all of you. It's quite an honor for me to be here with you and have this opportunity to talk a little bit about your very impressive stories and um, the work that went into uh, pulling them together. Um, before we get started, I'm just going to ask you a few questions and we'd kind of like everybody to have a chance to talk and tell uh, some of the backstory behind their uh, prize winning substantial work. But I also want to give a heads up uh, because uh, I did speak in the reception earlier with several students um, who were here, journalism students, and I just want to give them a bit of warning that we're going to come up on a question and answer period at the end of this conversation. And um, I'm going to um, take a moderator privilege and offer the, some of the first opportunities to ask questions to the students, the journalism students um, and others here. So get ready for that if you want. <laughs> um, uh, so, the well, there are several common threads among these uh, different but very interesting stories, and one of the uh, most powerful threads is uh, the complicity of government in mismanaging situations uh, at the cost to many people. And um, and so I wanted to start by asking you if you could talk a little bit about how you began your work on these particular stories. What were some of the kind of crucial pivot points in the reporting? And um, was there anything along the way that really surprised you? I know as journalists covering um, um, government and, and, and its work related to environmental um, issues, uh, this is a common theme across, uh, for many journalists, uh, government problems. Um, but what made these stories stand out to you and prompted you to dig deeper? And you all spent, of course, a very substantial amount of time on these stories. Um, so, uh, Hannah, would you like to go first? <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I feel like government dysfunction is not always the sexiest topic and sometimes sort of gets overlooked for that reason. Um, I started these stories when I was at the Washington Post and I was sort of trying to figure out what to do and I pitched a bunch of other things like trafficking or child sexual abuse and it turned out that somebody else in the newsroom was working on everything that I pitched and you know they were like you can't do this I'm doing it. And finally, I got to FEMA, and nobody was trying to do that. And, um, <laughs> but when I started digging into it, I mean, at first I thought, this is like covering insurance. Like, this is going to be impossible to make readable for people or to make interesting. Um, but it turned out that FEMA had sort of slowly over the last 10 years started basically denying almost all disaster survivors, just as as we know, natural disasters were increasing and there were like an order of magnitude more people living through these disasters. And a lot of what we were finding was really fixable stuff. So we did one story about how FEMA was denying black disaster survivors at a much higher rate than other people because of this sort of obscure bureaucratic reason having to do with land ownership documents. And we published the story and immediately FEMA fixed it. It was like nobody had been looking at this agency and there were just all these problems that were sort of seemed very fixable. So after that, I think we just decided to keep going. Oh, so that's a fascinating story. Here you were at one of the most prestigious newsrooms in the world uh, and um, 
and you were just looking around for an investigative story, and you said, hey, nobody is investigating this huge agency that has uh, had such an increase in, um, in its scope because of natural disasters increasing over the years. Exactly. So it was right there. Pretty it's not a fight for it. <laughs> fascinating. Sharon, um, you, uh, on the other hand, have been covering uh, similar stories for uh, and doing very substantial work on them for a very long time, right? Uh, yeah, so this ethylene oxide story is kind of like a series about ethylene oxide that was stretched over years. Because I, I had done, I think, two stories before about this chemical. Um, and one of them had showed that the EPA had responded really differently to contamination uh, in two towns. One was mostly African American, one was uh, a high income suburb of Chicago, mostly white. Um, and then uh, and then I returned to the subject, but I wasn't sure what I was gonna do, and there was a lot of turning points in this story. I, I was sort of, one of the things we realized was that there were a number of communities from that last story that were impacted, that had no idea that they were had this chemical in their air. And so after we did that story, the EPA Inspector General actually said to the EPA, you need to go tell those communities what's going on. And I realized that they hadn't. And in fact, the EPA had, had it was under Trump, they said no, they, you know, they got in a fight with the, with the IG. And so I was kind of following that, and as I was doing that, I was talking to some of the people in the communities that were affected, and I talked to this uh, one group in Lake County, Illinois, in Gurney, Illinois, and they told me, you know, the, in the course of a conversation, they happened to mention this one woman said, you know, we were preparing our presentation, and we went back and realized that the, the numbers had changed, and so it was really confusing. And it wasn't the point of her story, it was kind of an aside. And then I spoke to someone in Louisiana who also, as an aside, said the same thing. Hey, the numbers have changed. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> wait a minute. you know. And so we looked, and it was, I think, seven companies. And as um, Jelani said, it was 260,000 pounds had been like just written away. Um, that was one of the surprises. Another one, you know, came from, it really was something, I, I have to credit my editor, Roger Hodge, who's here, who said, I bet you the EPA told them to change their numbers. And I was like, no, Roger, that's not how it works. Like, <laughs> that's paranoid. And then, <laughs> and then it turned out he was right. <laughs> so that was a shock. Um, Anyway, th there are a lot of turning points in that story, and yeah, and, and the role of government, I mean, that's not only were they not doing what they were supposed to do, which was inform people, and inform people after, you know, they had been told by, by the watchdog, you know, in their agency that they needed to do it, but they were actually telling, telling companies, change these numbers, and the, and the reason you change these numbers is because here's the public record of you emitting carcinogens, you, you know, here's your liability, and they're like, actually, you might want to change that. So, anyway, I, I could go on, but I'll leave it there. It's jaw-dropping, isn't it? You know, it's, yeah. Uh, all of these stories, I had the experience when I was reading your story from Thermal, um, Elizabeth and Mauricio, of thinking, like, putting it down or walking away from the screen and saying, oh my God, they, they literally saved lives with this story. Um, because you, you had people, um, you, you prompted the government to move people and to add air conditioning, you know? Um, good job. <laughs> uh, so, um, I also, when I started reading your story from Thermal, I, I'm like, no, it's not really named Thermal. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Not really named Thermal. So, um, so my question was, was this just the name that this got you started <laughs> looking in this particular community, or how did the story get started? You know, this story started in like the most general way. Uh, basically, the deputy editor at ProPublica was like, why don't you look for a hot town? 
like it was like that broad, and she's always freezing, and so it was also that she had my vested interest. Uh, so I just started poking around, and the state of California keeps a ton of data that they map really well. So it would like as a journalist, like that made my life so much easier to be able to go to these um, these mapping programs that would had already crunched, you know, what are, what's the air like, what's the temperature like, who's documented, who's not documented. Um, but then, yes, of course, you see a town named Thermal, and you're looking to write a story about a hot town. And, um, you know, obviously, you poke around. And then the town itself, it felt like, to me, it was one of these stories that just, like, the floor kept dropping on, like, how messed up can something be? So then, in addition to being this extremely hot town with a huge undocumented farm worker population, the basically, Palm Springs resorts have been pushing east, and so in this same town is this private racetrack that's just like obscene wealth, and people are building a surf club, and it was just like, how can these two things be <laughs> in this one tiny, tiny little place that's not even incorporated? So, yeah. Yes, the name was attractive, and then it just wound up being like we were there reporting and it was like how do you even get your hands around everything that's wrong there because a lot of there's a big indigenous community and a lot of these terrible trailer parks are on native land and then the legal situation around that there's like a checkerboard of property rights that makes everything just fall through the cracks and like the museum's film is gorgeous and you can see the living conditions are sort of just beyond belief, even having read about the place and talked to people there before, before we went. Right. Uh, Mauricio, those uh, side-by-side -side images was um, such a powerful way to go. Um, uh, do, do you, can you share something about your uh, creative process in deciding how to tell this story um, from, from your perspective, from the visual perspective? Yeah. <coughs> Sorry. Um, the name of the neighborhood, by the way, is Oasis. So that's even more <laughs> frightening. Yeah, well, visually, uh, I, did, I did nothing. I mean, the contrast is there. It's, it's amazing. It's four miles away of a dilapidated house. It's this raised up park with nice homes and, and everything. And the, the hard part was to find Pedro and Maria. And, and those are the real heroes. I mean, they open the, their house and, and their problem, even though there are undocumented people. And they let me let us film the, the, the house, the conditions, the, the park, even when the community was like kind of against them. And, yeah. and, and the the easy part was to film the golf course, so for course, or rent uh, an Airbnb with air conditioning. With Film inside. I mean, that was the, the funny part, <laughs> the fun part. But yeah, that place is is really striking. But the sad part is that place is really similar to if so many places in the United States. I mean, there are so many communities that can't face what is coming, mm -hmm. and that is what I mean. But it's hard. Absolutely. So uh, we're in a journalism school here, and I think it's instructive to hear more about um, how you gain the trust of the two people you just mentioned, and also what was the outcome for them in the end. Well, gaining the trust is always a challenge, no matter the story. You can tell it better than me. <laughs> but I was the one who speaks Spanish, so I think that was. Like. I started trying to report this story on my own and could not. It was clear that we could not. I could have told like a story from, you know, ten thousand feet away, but to tell a really intimate story, Mauricio to join for Publica. Yeah, but I mean, I was lucky enough to meet Pedro. I mean, he was the one to take to make the decision. I mean, he was the one to risk. He is undocumented. He. I mean, he had to work from the, for the people. I mean, uh, he decided to talk. Yeah. And, and uh, from there, it's easy. I mean, it's just 
spend time with them and try to I mean, be respectful for, for their reality, for their kids, their family, and they are really they're amazing. Yeah. Better than Maria. <laughs> but the there end, was for the six months when I put the story aside, when I was still in touch with a community organizer, and we would talk regularly, and then she had introduced us to Pedro's family. And he had a lot at stake in talking to us, but uh, he wanted to be in this fight. He wanted to tell his story, and I feel like you can feel that in him. And in the end, the story had a big positive impact, right? <laughs> in the end, and that was a sort of complicated thing, I have to say, journalistically. Like, so Pedro and his family got moved into better housing while we were reporting the story. And was that because we were reporting the story? Like, did they get moved to the front of the line? Not unlikely that they got moved to the front of the line. Yeah. Yeah, at that time, they were the only ones. Yes. So, so there's been a lot of progress since the piece came out, but it was just this, like, very complicated moment. Absolutely. So, uh, so this, um, idea uh, that uh, environmental problems and crises have um, inequitable impact on people in different communities is also a common thread among all of the three stories here. Um, so what would you say are some uh, key ingredients in the reporting? I'd like to hear from, from you, Hannah, and you, Sharon, um, about key ingredients in your reporting um, that help um, elevate those elements uh, in the most respectful way and uh, maybe drive change for the people um, involved. Um, well, I was really lucky to get to work with Andrew Vatran, um, who's an incredible investigative data reporter. FEMA has all of this data about people who survive natural disasters, and it sort of technically is public but you really can't access it unless you know how to program, how to do the million things that Andrew knows how to do that I still really don't know how you did this. Um, but we were able to get millions of records going back years and years and quantified some things that had never been quantified. And I think these numbers were you know, just like mostly a paragraph in narrative stories, but having them there got the attention of policymakers in a way that I don't think you know, sort of a pure feature would have. And we, in the end, heard from members of Congress and even members of FEMA's own Office of Continuous Improvement asking for our analysis. And it was ridiculous because these were numbers that they had that we had to sort of fight with them for and crunch ourselves. And nobody had done that at this agency. Just because, you know, like you said, it's like bureaucratic, nobody's really watching. Um, so that was really helpful, I think, as far as the impact that this reporting had. Um, and then I think it was important to try to marry it with the stories of the people who are really being affected, like you guys did so beautifully. Because, you know, climate change, it's very, it's scary, and there's just so much, there's so many reasons to ignore it, I think, if you're a reader, or to not click through to that story. But I think people are just sort of universally drawn to these human stories of people facing adversity, trying to make their lives better, or trying to survive. Um, it's almost like a Trojan horse that you can use to get people to read about almost anything. Um, and that was certainly the case with these like otherwise very dry stories. Absolutely. Uh, everyone here did such a great job of, of um, weaving the narrative storytelling elements in with a lot of uh, very hard and, and um, a scary data, you know, difficult data. So, yeah, yeah. impressive. So, in, in my story, we had kind of two different groups of people and in two different places. So, there was um, Lake County, Illinois, and then Fort Beaches, Texas. Um, and in Lake County, it was super easy to connect with people. They had, because I'd written about this before, I'd written about Lake County before, and I'd written about Illinois before, and I had people I was in touch with already. And these were really activists who were doing some air monitoring, and they wanted their story to be told. And that was, um, and, and, and some of the, you know, one of them was a data analyst. And he, they were very advanced and sophisticated and, and, you know, and were eager to talk. 
Um, in Port Natives, it was harder. Um, but I, I don't even remember how I found these people. First, I was, oh, I was reading a local paper and I found one woman who was talking about the fact that her kid practiced on a football field near the plant and was concerned about it. And I called her and I was talking to her and through talking to her, she said, you know, I have a friend who, long story short, there were, I ended up meeting these eight women um, who had grown up in this, right by the plant in Port Natchez and four of whom developed breast cancer. And so we ended up making a film about them and, you know, uh, you, it was, it was difficult in some ways. They struggled about whether to talk. And it's really, I mean, one, because it's breast cancer and it's personal and, it, you know, it, it's exposing in the, that way, but also it's a company town and everyone was either married to or the sibling of someone who worked in one of these plants. It's very difficult to talk about this. They were very concerned about the, you know, what, what the ramifications would be for them. And, you know, and, and they're, the people they knew, they were afraid about losing their jobs. Um, and, but they did, they spoke and we made, and, and Lauren Feeney is here, the director of the video, and Paul Ballot was the person, one of two people who worked on that film with Lauren. Um, and it was, I thought, really beautiful. Um, they talked about, about they called themselves the Lucky Seven because they all had seven, they were lucky enough to have seven friends and they thought when the first one got cancer that it would be, you know, she said, oh, it's, you know, in a group our size, one of us has to get cancer and so it'll be me. But then it was like, no, then it was the next person, the next person, the next person. So they um, talked about all that in a moving way and I had really hoped that this story and the stuff that I dug up would help them. They wanted to sue. Uh, and because of a, a state law in Texas, it makes it incredibly difficult to sue. They haven't been able to. They give it just a very high bar in terms of the evidence you need. So anyway, that was disappointing. and We didn't see change in Texas. But, um, but I think that, uh, so there weren't like stunning results from this story yet. But I think keeping this, um, you know, keeping this chemical in the in the news is important, and, and Lake County has made some progress. But also, I think, the, <laughs> I think it makes the difference for these companies to know that people are poking around in their data and keeping their eyes on their reports <coughs> is actually um, hopefully going to be meaningful. I hope. I hope so too. <laughs> um, so uh, I have one more kind of set of questions I want to ask, and then we'll open it up to uh, questions from um, the people in the audience. And I just want to acknowledge that um, while the United Nations General Assembly is meeting here in New York, it is also Climate Week in New York City, and there are many, many activists um, in, in town also doing um, a lot of uh, activities that are designed to address um, climate change and, um, and other related environmental concerns. So uh, in that context, I'm kind of feeling like it's a, an interesting time to be doing environmental journalism and that uh, there is increasing interest in this topic. So um, my question is, what do people not understand about uh, environmental journalism and how it can impact uh, public conversation on these topics? Um, and, and would you agree or disagree with this uh, notion that this is uh, a, a t an in increasingly important time to be doing this kind of reporting? I mean, I'd say it's certainly an important time, increasingly important time for sure. And I, I guess I feel that I feel like people care maybe more than they used to. I mean, it's impossible not to to recognize the climate crisis, and 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 people care about water more than they used to. You know, related to the climate crisis, I I would say. Um, and what do they not understand no. about journalism? Do you think they? Uh, um, understand what journalists can or can't do in this uh, to help um, 
shed light on these topics? This isn't really directly an answer to that, but I feel like journalism uh, has not been wildly successful at covering climate. I think we there's more discussion of that all the time. We need we need more change than we have been seeing. And so I feel like one of the challenges is thinking about, okay, what can we do differently? What can we do better that actually results in faster change? Because in some ways, we're just kind of in a race <laughs> against, you know, there's time and what are the fossil fuel companies gonna do and how, how quickly is this gonna happen? And to me, it feels like there's a tremendous opportunity to try to sort of expand what we're doing and think about it in different ways and experiment and tell different kinds of stories to try to just push the whole thing along faster. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what kind of different stories do you think we should be doing? Yeah, I mean, to me, climate stories are really equity stories. Um, and I think everything old is new again right now. There's a huge amount of interest in this topic. It's becoming obvious to everyone that climate change is really here. Um, one of the stories in the FEMA series was about a FEMA trailer park. And this is a story that's been written so many times, I mean, from Katrina onward. It's very sad to live in a FEMA trailer park in like this terrible these places. And my editor wanted me to go out and find a FEMA trailer park that was closing and sort of hang out for the last week, the last two weeks, and just in bed with the family there. And I thought, that's gonna be boring and depressing. I've read this story. But we went, and I think because of this moment, it really did feel urgent. And so I hung out with the family in a trailer. It was a man and a woman. The woman was in a wheelchair, and she had been confined to a hospital bed in the middle of this trailer for two years. The trailer was surrounded by gravel. They never finished it, and so she hadn't left her house, really. <laughs> Nobody could come visit. It was like the ba most basic things, like get an ADA accessible trailer for a disabled woman. Um, but FEMA wasn't doing it. They lived in a town where there were constant wildfires. There was a wildfire while I was there. And just sort of painting that portrait, I think, in like a deep way, like spending enough time. I was there for so long. Like, Liz came and <laughs> right, we actually to ran into each other covering climate. Um, <laughs> my mom came and visited <laughs> for like weeks, like hanging out in this ash choked air. Um, and in the end, the park closed, and this family was basically out on the street along with a lot of other families. And you know, like we're talking about, I feel like the impact that these stories and kids have on a sort of specific level is amazing. Like, this is a rare case where readers donated fifty thousand dollars and it just solved this family's problem. Like that never happened. They just needed better housing, and FEMA pledged to sort of rejigger their system so that people go to apartments, not trailers. And I would have never expected that, but I think it's just it was sort of the right story at the right time. I don't think five years ago people necessarily would have been interested in, in like a climate equity story that way. Good for you for getting that out there. Um, Mauricio, um, what's your perspective uh, as somebody who focuses on visual storytelling um, and expertise, the deep expertise in that? What, um, uh, what do you feel about environmental journalism and what we could be doing better at this moment? Uh, I was told that for, for a Netflix streamer industry leader that uh, Climate change stories are they're not working well because people think that that topic is overwhelming. Mm -hmm. It's like it's too big, and we're we're doomed basically. So, and what I think that the success of, of our story is, as you said at the beginning, we did a meaningful story, like the story that you just said. I think we need to find creative ways to tell that story, those stories, the, the minimal stories, because the topic is huge and intersects with everything, housing, I mean, whatever. So I think we need to find creative ways to, to tell stories and that, that way create more awareness about the Absolutely, and of course, um, potentially focus on the solutions too. Yeah, I'm, I'm behind that. I, I, agree with the solutions journalism um, 
um, push that seems to be sort of uh, uh, a much easier way for people to also approach climate change. Okay, the moment is here. Um, there's a microphone there. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hello, good evening. Um, I'm a student here at the Graduate School of Journalism. And I think it's likely that I will spend the span of my career covering climate. Um, but as I begin in this field, I'm trying to challenge or push back, I guess, against the tradition of um, competitiveness between journalists. So my, my question is, what is the value that you see um, in regards to collaboration, specifically as it applies to covering climate and climate journalism? I'll answer that. Like, I think it is so incredibly helpful to collaborate on climate stories, partly even just to be able to um, do visual journalism that can like take care of the data, <laughs> that can you know capture and communicate that piece incredibly clearly and incredibly well, and then it can sort of let you protect your narrative and let, if you want to do that, you know, it can let another piece be its, its best self for what it is, but because you know, as we've all been saying, like climate involves so many different systems at so many different levels that to me it feels like crucial to collaborate in a way that stories that are less layered have less of a demand for it. That was a good question, Lou. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any, uh, who else has a question? Yeah. Hi, I'm a graduate school. Um, I'm a student at the Graduate School of Journalism here as well. Uh, I have a question. So, environmental stories are usually very sad, for the lack of a better term, that our environment is getting degraded, the earth is dying, soon we might too. How do you make it more... Uh, how do you make it more engaging for an average reader that they read it and take action on it? Reading is not enough. Like, taking an action on it is the essential part of it. So solutions journalism is one thing. How do you make it better so that people actually read it? Like majority of the people I know, whenever they see a headline of environmental journalism, they, they're like, yeah, we know that the earth is dead. We can't do anything about it. So how do you get past that whole problem? I think that's such a great question. It's like the animated question of my whole life, is how do you get people to read things? Assuming that they don't want to, which I think is a really fair assumption for almost every journalistic endeavor. Um, I find it really helpful to try to write stories that have a lot of elements of joy and, you know, happy moments in them. Like, for example, with this trailer story, we had a whole scene where this woman gets to take a bath finally, and she's so excited. It's just, there's no reason that scene is in the story except to give the reader sort of a break. And I think, I saw the same thing in the thermal story, like you guys really evoke the family. And you know, people, even when they're going through hard times, are not always sad. Like nobody is just melancholy all the time. And I think there's so much value in putting those sort of just normal moments of like silliness or delight in stories that are even about serious things like this. It's a great, great answer. The scene setting techniques of of um, fiction, but with reality. Absolutely. I have a question. Go for it. I'm not a student here, <laughs> but uh, this is in the service of other of helping other students. Um, it's related to the idea that these stories are so, are often depressing, but it, they're also often incredibly complicated with. Like, vocabulary, a scientific vocabulary that is so foreign to the reader. And I wondered if you had any practical tips for how to do interviews with people who basically speak a different language, they speak the language of climate and science, to get them to speak in a way that's accessible to a mainstream audience. I guess I would partly say that that's your job. <laughs> that like a scientist is going to speak in their language, but you don't have to quote them all the time. And that, yeah, I 
do you think like breaking out of lingo that I feel like all these problems are related to me that, that it's sort of the scientific lingo can be distancing and I think that can cause people not to want to act and I so to me a piece of it is just taking on that job for yourself and learning enough about it that you can put things in terms that are that maybe are fungery maybe you get somewhere with voice maybe you get somewhere with dark humor like I, I feel like your question is an incredibly good one and that part of it I feel like is is just <clears throat> taking care and liberty with how you put your words on the page I'm actually a video person so <laughs> like, well no I mean that's a legitimate answer but it in, when I was teaching, that was always a huge question, is how do you get experts in fields like science, or any expert field, mm -hmm. to help you to shape the information in a way that's accessible? Are there any tricks? Are there any, like, you know, talk to me like I'm a smart eighth grader, or, which is something that people say, but I don't know. We've been doing it for well, a long time. It, it's harder for video, right? Yeah. Right, you, know, you can't do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, I mean, when when you go to these communities, everybody understands. Everybody can understand. You know what I mean? Like the base, like they know what's going on, and so you know you can use use the terms that the people who are experiencing it use too. You know what I mean? And you can fact check with the experts, but they know the problem. Right. I rather always try to use the character, the main character, to tell the story, mm -hmm. than to have a bunch of, of good people that know the problem the, the way it really is, but they are connect with the story. So the idea of being use use a lot of the presence of the people who are being affected. Yeah. Yeah. I just observed that this is one of the very challenging and fun aspects of environmental journalism is that you do have to understand the scientists and it uh, develops a, a level of expertise to talk to them. Hi, um, I'm also a student here um, and I would love to hear a little bit about your process of kind of pivoting after something like each of these projects was so immersive and I'm sure you learned an incredible amount. Um, and then in the end, there'll come a time when it's time to like kind of pivot to the next story. So I would love to kind of hear about that process for, for you. Yeah. I, 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 can, I remember this pivot really well. So I'm just going to um, we I was months on that story. And, but then I had another story that was kind of like hooking around along the background. And I had actually a very hard deadline with that story. And this, this story got dragged out so far that I had a week in which to finish this other story. Roger, do you remember this? And um, <laughs> and so I pivoted, I can say it very quickly, and, <laughs> and did not think about it. And then, you know, that was helpful, a deadline. But you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, mean, I, I fell on the floor. Yeah. 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 about the rest of you, like when do you know that uh, it, it is an editor who usually helps with that, right? Well, one luxury if you do project reporting, which I think we probably come up here all do, is you can sort of have like a slash and burn approach if you're going, if you're doing accountability project reporting. So with FEMA, like I don't think they'll ever talk to me again. They never will. But it doesn't matter because after you're done with the project, you pivot away and those people will never be in your life again. Um, so there's something sort of freeing about that. Not for everyone. <laughs> Um, Hi, um, I'm also a J School student here. Um, I'm studying data journalism specifically to cover climate change. Um, and my biggest fear, I guess, as a person who's trying to do climate reporting, is the fact that um, you know we all get used to things. You know, we used to the fact that you know, like all of Puerto Rico is out of power, or the fact that you know a third of Pakistan is underwater. You know, we get sort of accept we accept things that oh, that's just kind of how it is. Um, and my question is, how do you bring urgency sort of to these important stories in a way that, 
you know, for some people who might have gotten used to the fact that they're all just, you know, this is the new world, and just telling them, like, maybe it's not, or, you know, maybe we still have to care about these things. Um, what are some of your, like, ways of thinking to bring the urgency back to your stories? Can I just say, as a non-climate reporter, for me, the watching the um, climate bill pass when nobody thought it would pass, and watch, you know, and then watching California pass a climate bill, I mean, like, you know, as I guess project-based investigative reporters, you're not doing that kind of daily coverage or politics coverage, but for me, like, th that's part of the story here. It, part of the story is that we're being devastated you know, devastating climate change. And another part is that is that clearly not everybody is giving up and that like change is being actually, change is happening. And so, I don't know, I just, um, it's part of the story too. Does anyone else have a, a good response? Okay, I mean, I think just to echo Marie's just point, like if you get small enough, I feel like you can, maybe bounce people out of their complacency into like deeply caring in a way that doesn't just feel like climate, even though you're telling a climate story. So in some ways, I feel like getting all the way to the bottom. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm a student here at the Duke School as well. Um, my question is more so, so for all of the pieces that you guys reported on, there was that angle on, you know, in the focus on racial equity. And how, my, my question is more so in terms of like, how do you balance that with putting it under the lens of being a climate issue? Um, specifically just because, you know, you're working with government kind of neglecting its citizens and there are all these structural institutions in place that's part of history and for such a long time. But now it's becoming more evident that minorities are the ones that are facing climate change more so at a faster rate. And so how do you kind of bring that other layer of like climate when, you know, it's easy to just say, oh, but it's it's a structural issue. It's something that is between the government and these minority folks. Um, by bringing in that angle of climate um, because it's also such a big topic as well and weaving it into those stories that are already so complex. I feel like it'll just increasingly become part of every story. Like, we all live here. Uh, the world is changing so fast and I feel like in the in ways in which sort of a lot of inequity issues now get woven through criminal justice, like all kinds of reporting, I think and hope that climate reporting will also sort of follow that path and just become part of the background of any story that you're telling and it'll less have to be like, oh, this is a climate story. Thank you. Any other responses to that? Um, I think uh, I think there are also um, obviously we're in a moment of great creativity in journalism platforms too, in journalism approaches. And I think there might be more opportunity to see some more voices in different voices of helping to shape the future stories, and that's going to be part of. Uh, how that story evolves in environmental journalism and health journalism. So I'll just say that. Um, uh, so there's plenty of opportunity to um, for for more people of different backgrounds and different perspectives to step in and do this work. Any other thoughts? I think. Go ahead. Hi, I'm also a student here, and I was wondering how you find an end to your reporting, especially in places where everything seems to be wrong, and there's so many layers to it. How do you decide, okay, this is enough, and this is a story? It's hard. <laughs> <laughs>
the effect that a story could have. I think I used to write a lot more stories that were sort of panoramic, like this is everything that's wrong with the child welfare system, and it's a ton of stuff. And now, I mean, I think really working at ProPublica trained me to think more in terms of what's one thing that could be fixed, that if we wrote about it, probably said we could fix it, because it's so obviously a problem and fixable. And that's really helped me with this problem, which is so hard. Um, it sort of helps to put on blinders and just focus on one issue. When, when you do this kind of reporting a couple of times, you see like, oh yeah, when you do it that way, things often are fixed and it's really satisfying. Um, so it's a little, you know, I don't know. It's a little mercenary, but it often works for me. Well, nobody's paying you to specifically fix their problem, right? To yeah. Be very clear. No, of anybody course, is ever course, listening to no, this. No, I'm not talking about the so fun I'm talking about systemic <laughs> issues that well, go beyond I one person who needs a new trailer. I say that because some people don't understand journalism ethics. A lot of people don't understand journalism ethics, right? Yeah, no, that's a great point. Yeah. Okay, I guess we. Is, is Abby telling you you're out of time? Oh, oh, oh. Of course, uh, but I had a question too. Um, you guys are at the height of your game, and you're all changing jobs. So I wanted to get your take on the journalism industry, what it's like to be working in this field right now. Um, additionally, so tell us sort of where I, you all won awards for work at organizations where you're not working anymore. Not all of you, but many of you. Sorry, Mauricio. Mauricio is still a professor. Yes, I know. Um, so just comment on the state of the industry, what it's like. And also, you know, we always ask just advice for people starting out. One piece of advice, if you could all give a piece of advice. Yeah, I mean, my main advice is just that journalism is really competitive, but there are jobs out there, and I think, you know, like you were saying, there are jobs out there, and in climate journalism, there's, I think, a huge need for more diversity, like, in the entire field, but climate stories, because they are really equity stories, and because for whatever reason, I think those parts of the newsroom tend to be even more white than, like, the already very white newsroom. Um, there's just such a need for new people to come in, people from different backgrounds to come in. And I think journalists often like to scare younger journalists about the state of the industry. Like, when I was studying, somebody told me that they had walked across a burning bridge while it burned, and now there were no more jobs, and I was never get <laughs> like, that obviously wasn't true. Um, so, yeah, I hope you guys ignore those cranky journalists and forward um, and because yeah, mm -hmm. so I, I was at the Intercept for seven years, and I just moved to ProPublica. Um, and I guess I, I spent a long time freelancing before that, and I just feel so like grateful to have the opportunity wherever I am to do this work. And so, and I think there there is a, I mean, there are jobs, um, but these both are pretty great jobs. And so I feel I guess. They're out there, and I feel like the way that I got, what I would tell to people and advice is to whatever degree possible, really just do exactly what you want to do. You know, like I remember when I was freelancing at some point, some women's magazine wanted me to write a piece on urinary incontinence, and I was like, no. And, and, and I just like it was this, you know, because it was like, ah, I have no money, you know. And then it was like, we no. And like, it was, just I remember that moment was like a really good moment for a long time ago. And like, just like going, like, and it, just sticking to exactly like, like you know in your heart what you want to do and what you think is important. And, and at least for me, like following that has been a good way to go. Uh, and to reiterate some of the things, so I feel like particularly in climate journalism right now, like there, there's a need for more diverse journalists, more diverse voices, 
data journals. So it's like it's the biggest story ever, and uh, it will continue to be the biggest story ever. And it's been kind of this problem spot. So it seems really like an exciting time if you're into it <laughs> to figure out like how to do it. Like we're saying, like figure out how to do it your way because people don't just want the thing that's been done. People want people want to figure out what is the new way and there's nobody's got a perfect answer and there's not going to be one answer. So. And I think today is a great, a great um, day to start because you have, <laughs> yeah, sorry about that, because you have the reading, but you have, you have words, you have the podcast, you have the video, you have the data. I mean, you have so many opportunities. I mean, you can be journalists in all of them. So. And it's also a generational story, like being young is a plus as a final journalist. <laughs> okay, this is the last question. Thank you. Was there some point in the pursuit of your stories where you were changed by what you were pursuing, where you were impacted? by the story itself where you put down all of your journalistic skills and came up with a humanitarian approach and said this is something that I have not experienced that grew you as a journalist and if that happened what can you share with those individuals who want to who are pursuing or aspiring to be journalists that they will not find taught in the classrooms at school but the classrooms of life <laughs> Great question. Okay. How did it transform you? Uh, well, it made me more skeptical than I was to begin with, which I thought was impossible. So, <laughs> you know, and, and actually that's a good thing, right? I mean, in this job. Like, when... He was right. Yeah, my editor was right. Or tell them. They, and, and the fact that, like, then when, when, like, I thought, could this be a pattern? Could this actually be going on? It, well, it was. Like, that kind of said so that it kind of confirmed my hunch in that way. And then, I mean, in every time I work, I spoke with so many people with cancer for this story, so many people. And... You know, every and I, I've done this for years. Spoken with people who have lost relatives, and and it's um, every time like it, it's it's um it, it's sad, and you experience you have like a, have a moment with them about it where they're sharing something really important, and like I feel like I take that with me, and you know it changes me. I don't know how, but like it, it it's it's important to me, and I feel as a human and not just as a journalist. Sharing that. Yeah. I feel like we were both so changed the first time we went to Pedro and Maria's trailer and the idea that like I live in California, this is just in California, like that to be in their home with this family that was taking so much risk and telling their story, it was a pretty <laughs> profound moment of their courage and it felt like a real responsibility in a way that, like, was, I don't know, sounds corny, but it was an honor to, to, to be there and be trusted, and it felt really important to do just what you were saying, just like, let go of all the professional trappings and just be with this family in their home and then try to not lose that. Yeah, I mean, I think I was similarly just struck by the vulnerability of the people who I was writing about in these stories and the trust that they put in me. One of the stories involved rural, rural um, Alabama, and I was writing about people who had had their land stolen for generations by white outsiders who come in and trick them, basically. They've taken like 90% of the black owned land in this county. And I came in and I needed to see their documents to show that they really, you know, had been rejected by FEMA for the reasons that they were saying, so I needed to see these documents that, you know, it was very scary for them to show some white outsider, nobody knew where the Washington Post was in this town. Um, and in the end, a lot of people ended up really telling their stories, but a lot of people also decided not to. 
and it was a good reminder for me to, you know, respect that, like respect the bravery of the sources who decide to participate, but also there's just so many good reasons to say no, and that's sort of equally important to, to be okay with. What about you, Mauricio? Uh, I think, I mean, the story started as a story of a hot town, right? Mm -hmm. And everything changed from that roof. Remember yeah. the day that we met Pedro and went to the roof? And we see the holes and we, see, we feel the, the hot and everything changed there. Yeah, the vulnerability like of the people changed. Like yeah. just like anybody's kids and this is their yard. And people in the center is the way of this. Okay, well, I think uh, these were very impressive stories that uh, I know that I'll remember for a very long time. Um, and it's been, uh, I think, a, a wonderful experience for all of us to hear some more detail about um, how you pull them together and, um, and to hear your insights as well on the future of environmental journalism and the future directions. So I want to once again say congratulations to all of you on winning this very important award and prestigious award. The competition was very stiff. Um, and uh, thank you for doing the important work you do.